to El Nino and it its implication for acute food security in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, I'm the field scientist. I'm working uh, based in Guatemala. Yeah. So, Lark, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lark Walters. I am the decision support advisor for FuseNet's early warning team based in Washington, D.C. Back over to you, Mario. Okay. Thank you. So the outline of the presentation of today is um, we will review the El Nino event 2023-2024, the current effects of El Nino on the rainfall performance, the rainfall forecast for the upcoming months, and also the implications for acute food security. Next, please, Lark. Okay. Uh, this is uh, uh, the presentation about the, how El Nino is conducting, but we will start uh, talking about who, who is El Nino. So uh, we will start with the, the overview. So El Nino basically consists in three phases. The first phase is the Enzo Neutral. Next, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, on neutral condition that happen is that we have the warm uh the trade winds warm goes to the atmosphere and then produce some rainfall close to the areas in in central america and also the cold that we have over the seas help to have a normal rainfall over over the region especially in central america then we have another two scenarios. The neutral scenario is when we have normal conditions on the sea, but also we could have La Nina, that there is the next scenario. And when we have La Nina, that occurs is that uh, the easily trade winds uh, uh, strengths and the warmest surface of the waters move further westward and cool subs subsurface water that we have here in the Eastern Pacific, create more quantity of rainfall over Central America. So we have the same uh, condition here. We can see clearly the how the warm goes to the atmosphere and then it's going down, but with more quantity, we can see in the flag now moving down. This means that we have more quantity. And that is happening now that we have El Nino is that again the easterly trade winds winds are weakened, allowing warmer surface water that remain in the central and eastern Pacific part of the ocean that that, that we have here. So that means that the water are moving up before the area that usually we have that corresponds to Central America, and that is the reason why we have first a reduction of the rainfall follow well by less days of rainfall this year for example we have uh, some months where we only have 10 days of rainfall for example in june and july so now moving to to the to the next slide the enso is related with the change in temperature and the wind patterns in the pacific ocean that have global effects that well the atmosphere uh, and the earth in general try to have always equal values around the globe and to keep these equal values we need to have the movement of uh, this uh, of these winds around the world usually in the area of El ecuador and using the itc theta that we call the uh, in a convergence uh, sun that moves all these uh, these winds and erase the deficit of, or increase that we have around the world. For that, we uh, they usually use the that we call uh, the Walker uh, area that we have here. We can see that here is the Ecuador, and in the Ecuador we begin to have this circulation of water that comes and then returns again here in, in neutral conditions close to, to Central America, produce rainfall, and then this move 
in other areas continues with this circulation and helping to erase the the different values that we have when we have next please la niña conditions we can see how increased these values and also we have cold conditions here in in el ecuador in an area that we will will see in the next slide called uh el niño region 3.3 uh, go back please uh, thank you uh, uh that we call el niño 3.4 that is the, the most important area that we need to monitor. So again, we have here, uh, the winds are moving across the atmosphere and create the rainfall here. And also as we have cold conditions here in over the sea, increase the quantity of water that we usually receive in Central America. But when we have El Nino, next slide, that's occur is the opposite. We have the, the conditions begin here this is the warm conditions then guns uh, comes here and then goes to O. but before that we are over central america and this is because we have warm conditions over the ocean here and this is the reason why we have a reduction of the rainfall because the rainfall is not coming here it's just going up before we are in touch with uh, the continental area next slide please now the characteristics of el nino is very identifiable features including intensity and flavor not all the ninos is the same there is something to be need to be to be clear for example the generic characterized by extreme of sea surface temperature departures from average that is the intensity and the location of the departures that is the flavor so next is Click, please. Yeah. Do you remember? So El Nino uh, 97, 98. Uh, I think that everybody remember that because we have Mitch over Central America. This is an intensity strong. And the flavor is in the Eastern Pacific area. We can see here how the warm condition is very clear extended since the central area of Ecuador until the coastal sun here also in the country of uh, uh, el ecuador and also included all in our countries in south america this is a strong el nino also we have a weak intensity and the flavor is more usual in the central pacific as we can see here we can see warm conditions over the central pacific and we call that this is weak and then we have a moderate el nino that occurs in 2009 2010 we can see more warm condition over the central pacific but the the color is more close to to 1.5 or or 2 than this one that is between 0.5 and 1 next please so how we monitor the enso do you remember that i talk about it an area that we call a nino 3.4 that is that corresponds for the re black rectangle that we are looking here and also we can uh see this uh, this area this is the most important for us to determine how uh, el nino will be in intensity and by example here next uh, uh, please we can see the cold condition that we call uh, this is la nina but now that we have warm condition this is clearly a uh, condition of el nino and we can see that this is a strong El Nino. Why? Because we are looking that these are moving close to the continental area in uh, South America. So that is the reason why we can say that this picture corresponds to an strong El Nino. Next, please. So also we can see the variability that we have uh, between the events of El Nino and La Nina. So El Nino is always warm condition, is the red color, and La Nina is the cold condition, is the, the blue color. So we can see over that area what, how the temperature it is, we can define if we are experiencing an El Nino or La Nina. But what is happening if we don't have a clearly sign about we have? Next, please. Okay, we can say that the neutral conditions correspond 
when we are between less 0.5 and 0.5. When we are over that values, we say that we are in neutral condition. A neutral condition means that we are <coughs> uh, or normal uh, or the usual pattern of rainfall. Then if we are below of less 0.5, we have La Nina and, and we are above 0.5, we are El Nino. But what has happened with the flavor of El Nino? So, well, we know that El Nino is happening, but it's uh, an extreme event. It's a, a event that we usually have. How we determine how El Nino it is? So, next slide, please. This will depends of the threshold that we have of the anomaly here. We have a weak El Nino if the value correspond between 0.5 to 1. A moderate El Nino is between 1 or 1.5. And then the strong El Nino is above of 1.5. You can see here that the more extreme events of El Nino occurring 2015 here, and we can see this is the, the, the extreme event recorder uh, in the historical value. We can see another important events here of El Nino that's happening, others that is weak, others that is moderate. And something important is that a strong El Nino doesn't mean that Central America will be have a big impact. Some cases when we have a moderate or weak El Nino, we have less rainfall in Central America than a strong El Nino. But it's something that, that we need to talk maybe in another meeting. Next, please. Now we will call about the forecast for the rest of the season. So this is the, the most likely uh, event that we can expect. We can see that El Nino conditions will be keep with us until April, June of uh, the next year. There is something interesting because that means that the beginning of the Primera season of the next year will be affected by the ends of conditions. And then we can see that we are moving to neutral condition. Something important here is that despite we are in neutral condition, that doesn't mean that immediately we will move to average rainfall. This is because the atmosphere and the sea needs some time to adjust the values again. So despite we can move to neutral condition, so maybe during August, September, that doesn't mean that since September, the rainfall will be like the average. We will continue under El Nino uh, conditions. In the meantime, the sea and the atmosphere adjust the conditions that, that they have. That is something important to note. So average uh, conditions after any event called El Nino or La Nina doesn't mean immediately uh, normal rainfall. Next, please. <laughs> So this is how a strong El Nino will be. So for now, we have a uh, 49% that El Nino will be moderate, uh, strong, and a 49% that will be moderate. But for September to November, we can see how increased the threshold for a strong El Nino that will persist until December, February. Then from January to March, we can see that we are moving for a strong El Nino to a weak El Nino for the beginning of the Primera rainy season of the next year. That, that is more than less that's happened that this year. We are we in, with a weak El Nino at the beginning of the season. And we can say that more than less the scenario with the rainfall pattern will be similar that we experience uh, that this year. Next, please. So the current effects of El Nino in a rain, in, on the rainfall performance. So El Nino not means deficit of rainfall at all in the globe. So we can see that some areas in Africa have less rainfall and others have more rainfall. But for us in LAC region, we clearly see that correspond to dry conditions. So that means that we experience a deficit of rainfall when we usually have an El Nino event. Next, please. 
So this is the rainfall during this year and in the, in the past in the moderate strong El Nino. This is from April to August. So we can see here how the deficit of rainfall is very persistent over the region for all the primera season and the beginning of the, the segunda season. Also, something important to the note here is that we can see some small areas, for example, here in Huehuetenango, close to, to Mexico, in Guatemala, and also in areas of La Raan, Irás, in Nicaragua, where we can see white condition that is close to the average. So average rainfall doesn't mean that we are having a good distribution of rainfall. Usually we have high cumulative rainfall in short time, maybe in 10 days, we have the values that we must be have in one month. So average rainfall, yes, but not means a distribution according to the crop's needs. There is something important to denote because until a Nino condition, we usually also have increase of rainfall in short time. The K here is the distribution of the rainfall is not according to the crop's need. Also over Haiti, we can see <laughs> mainly average conditions, just some area here close to Republica Dominicana and South area with below average rainfall. So there is something that's a tricky because we know the effect of El Nino over Haiti with the reduction of the yields and the, the deficit of rainfall. But for all the period, the rainfall looks like average, but doesn't mean that the crops have a normal development. Over Venezuela and Colombia, we can see mixed conditions, average rainfall, and some areas with below average rainfall. And here, this is the forecast that we have from August to December rainfall. We can see the deficit of rainfall. It's very, very clear, especially over the Pacific Basin of Central America for the rest of the period. Remembering that from in October, usually we have the end of the rainfall over the Pacific Basin in Central America. So that means that the rainfall from September and October will be below to the average over the, the Pacific Basin in Central America. Over Haiti, we can see that the soil also will experience a slightly below average condition. But something important here to look is how the Caribbean area of Venezuela and also the Caribbean area in Colombia and other suns in land in Colombia also will experience the below average uh, rainfall under El Nino moderate strong from the period of August to December. Next, please, Lark. Yeah, so the rainfall performance, just to have an idea, this is April to, to September uh, rainfall. This is from, from April 1 to, to August 31 that cover all the primera season and the beginning of the segunda season. We can see the deficit of rainfall here. Something interesting is the north of Guatemala that usually has been not affected by a strong deficit of rainfall <laughs> over recent events of El Nino. Now has been very, very strong affected, especially in, uh, in, the, uh, in the department of Petem with some areas that only have a 60% of the usual rainfall for whole the period. And now, looking here, the information since the middle of August, uh, uh, end of August to middle of September, how the deficit of rainfall increase, especially in area of Ran in Nicaragua. That is something important because it's an important production area for the segunda season over Central America. So this is, uh, the most important production sun for the segunda season because they produce beans that they export to Honduras, El Salvador, and also Costa Rica. Over Haiti, we can see that the rainfall looks very close to, to the average, but again, uh, the pattern of rainfall is, uh, is not uh, uh, good for the normal development of crops. Over Colombia and Venezuela, the deficit of rainfall persists, but we can see and a small area over the Caribbean zone with above average condition, but it's very localized. Next, please. So the rainfall of September and October, that is something that worries me because September is the second peak month of rainfall for the year. The first one is June and the second is September. 
and we can see here how September has been very dry across Central America with important deficit of rainfall, especially in areas of the dry corridor that begins here in the Pacific uh, area in uh, Costa Rica, moving across the central zone of Nicaragua and connecting with all the central area of, of Guatemala. So this deficit of rainfall also affects the late sowing activities of the primera season, but also affect the sowing activities of the segunda season. Some small farmers this decide don't continue with the sowing activities because the soils are very dry and the rainfall will be in in two or three weeks because usually under a Nino conditions, the rainy season in Central America ends one or two weeks uh, before of the usual time that occurs in late October or beginning of November. So we can see that the deficit in September is it's very high. And also field reports indicate that the farmers are still waiting for sowing activities, but when they have moisture, they decide don't continue with, with this activity. And just to have an idea of how irregular is the rainfall distribution, I have this, this another map here uh, on, the, on the right. When we can see these maps correspond to September 25 to October 5, and we can see a big cumulative rainfall over the Pacific area of Honduras and Nicaragua, close to the Gulf of Fonseca. That means that we have 100 more of the usual rainfall just in 20 days. So there is something that usually happens with El Nino, but doesn't mean that this a lot of rainfall will be beneficial for beneficial for the crops. Some areas has been reported with flash flood, and the losses of the farmers that have sowing activities also has been reported, not for dryness. These areas has been affected by the exceed of moisture. Usually, the second season in Central America is mainly beans, and the and the beans is a very sensitive crop to the increase of moisture. So. That is just we have an idea that how irregular is the rainfall over El Nino conditions. Over Haiti, we can see this this is important increase of rainfall since since the central to the north part of the country. But in general terms, the the rainfall of the period looks like like average. And over Venezuela and Colombia, we can see mixed conditions with above average rainfall and below average rainfall too. Next, please. Another important driver that that is something that is uh, very, very important for, for this year is not only we have El Nino that usually means a reduction of the rainfall, we also are experiencing an increase of the temperature and this reduced the moisture into the soils. So the reduction into the, the moistures into the soils means that if we don't have a continuity of uh, rainy days, but if the soils keep the moisture, this helps to a normal development of crops. Unfortunately, we experienced since the uh, middle of the last year above average temperatures over the region. In many areas of Central America and also Colombia, Venezuela, and Haiti, we have new monthly records of maximum temperature recorded daily. So there is something important to the note is not only. Uh, the decrease of the rainfall for El Nino. We are experiencing warm conditions at global level, but that are affecting a lot the Central America. In average, the anomalies of temperature are between 1.5 to 2.5 Celsius degree above to the average for this year. And uh, this also create a reduction in the moisture into the soils also for the for the water for irrigation so they need to have um, more deep introductions to obtain water for irrigation and also the level of the rivers it's going down so that means that to the to the future this the water will be another important problem for irrigation and other activities in 
in the region in Central America. So we can see in the in the left map the mean temperature recorded that is close to 30 Celsius degrees across all Central America. Just some areas are between 24, 26 Celsius degree when usually are 23 or, or 22. So that means that is if there is a, an, an important increase. And then when, when we check the mean temperature difference from average, uh, for the last uh, uh, 30 days is close to 0.5 Celsius degrees of anomaly. So there is something uh, also important. It's another big driver that we are experiencing. It's not only this El Nino, it's the high temperatures experiencing. Next, please, Lark. Now moving to the rainfall forecast. Thank you. So the short term uh, rainfall forecast in October, we can see mixed conditions over, over Central America. We can see above average uh, rainfall, for example, in areas close to, to Mexico, but the below average rainfall will persist over the Pacific areas in El Salvador, also in Costa Rica and Panama. But the, the, the KC uh, here is the, the Caribbean area in Nicaragua, where we have the segunda season ongoing. And we have deficit of rainfall uh, for the previous month, and also the forecasts are calling us for a deficit of rainfall almost from October 11 to uh, October uh, 17. So there is a, a problem for the segunda season. And we can see in Colombia and Venezuela, the below average rainfall is very consistent in both countries, just in the Amazon area in Colombia, we have a forecast of above average rainfall and over Haiti, we also have uh, below average rainfall expected for the end of the uh, segunda season. And if we move, move to the next uh, week for 18 to 24, we can see the change here with above average rainfall over the central part of Nicaragua in uh, the the RAS area that we expect to help to the crops of, of the segunda season and also leave some moisture for the sowing activities of Apante that usually begins in November and on December. But under El Nino condition, usually the Ministry of Agriculture of Nicaragua recommends to the farmers begin early sowing activities to approach the rainfall over the Caribbean basin in December and in January. So the deficit of rainfall also will persist across uh, the Pacific area since the Gulf of Fonseca in Honduras, moving across all uh, El Salvador and connecting with the Franja Transversal del Norte in Guatemala, close to the north part with Petén Department. And again, the deficit of rainfall will persist in Colombia, Venezuela, and also Haiti again just this area in the Amazon in Colombia will be have above average rainfall. Next, please, Lark. So the rainfall forecast uh, through December, near average to below average rainfall is forecasted by multiple agencies, including the European model, that is the first one that we have in the left. We can see below average rainfall, especially over Venezuela and it's more area over the Caribbean sun in in Nicaragua, that is, that is slightly below three average, but also calls to above average conditions over Haiti. The WMO, that is the next that we have uh, to the right, are calling to below average rainfall over Venezuela and Colombia, and also over Nicaragua, that is the, the important country now until February of the next year will be Colombia, it will be Nicaragua, I'm sorry, because Nicaragua is the most important production of uh, basic grains for Central America at that time of the season. Also include above average conditions over Haiti. The North American model, again, is showing us below average rainfall over Nicaragua, especially over the Raas uh, region, and below average rainfall over Venezuela and Colombia. Over Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, we can see that uh, the condition is, is white. And the reason is because we don't have rainfall at that time of the season for the upcoming months. So no rainfall uh, means that the average conditions will occur. And then 
we have the NOAA, uh, the last that we have here, uh, right? With below average rainfall expected over many areas of Central America and also being very consistent with the below average rainfall over Colombia and Venezuela. Next, please. Uh, finally, this is an analysis from the yeah, UCSB Climate Hazard Center uh, about the temperature forecast at throughout November. Above average conditions will persist according to Church Era 5 anomaly. We can see the above average condition, especially over the Pacific uh, Basin of Central America and in general in Central America. And why that is important this above average temperature, despite we don't have rainfall at the time of the season. That is important because the high temperatures and the no rainfall will be affect the soils by cracking because the temperature will be above average and the soils are very dry. That means that these begin to crack in the middle of the beginning of the primera season of the next year. And that means that for the sowing activities of the next year, we need more cumulative rainfall to reduce these, uh, these holes into the soils to begin the sowing activities. So for the next year, the scenario will be that we will be have a delay of the sowing activities, not only for the regular distribution of, rain, of rainfall, also because we need to recover the soils of the high temperatures or the dry conditions observed during this month. And, and the map that we have here in the, in the right, we can see uh, clearly the above average condition only based on the, on the church anomaly for all the lag region. The difference is the values in some areas will be 2.5 to one Celsius degree and, and others will be above one Celsius degree and the yellow areas that we expect that this will be not more than uh, 0.5 Celsius degree. But the key thing again is that the, the, the temperature will be continuous being above to the average. Next, please. Uh, the mesoscale uh, models also indicate us that the temperature will be above to the average across all the region. That is something that we need to, to understand very well and also we will prepare for the next year for this scenario. This also favor uh, plagues and uh, another uh, type of disease in, uh, in the crops. This year we have some reports uh, over crops production areas, especially in large farmers, but uh, the next year will be worsened. Next, please. Just uh, before to, to large talks, there is something that, that I need to highlight is that despite the at country level, the yields will be appears like close to the average, the most uh, affected farmers here are the subsistence farmers, are the small farmers. So maybe this doesn't appear in the general production uh, counts in the country, and we can say, well, we have average yields in Guatemala, average yields in Honduras or Nicaragua. But the problem is that the small farmers don't have uh, the possibility to, to produce their own grains for the food. Thanks, Lark, for the time. Thank you, Mario, for that very well presented overview of ENSO and the, and the forecasts. I'll now... Uh, translate this forecast into how FuseNet is factoring this into uh, acute food insecurity projections. And Mario set this up very well with his concluding comments there, because before we go into the observed um, impacts on crop production and what the expectations are in the future, it's really important to start with an understanding of the relative importance of local crop production and who's most affected by it in each of the countries that FuseNet covers. So starting with Central America, the context here is that maize, beans, and rice are the main staple foods grown in the Central American region. And typically this region is self-sufficient in maize supply, uh, structurally surplus producing in bean supply, and then deficit uh, in rice supply. It's also important to understand that Central America has uh, a large rural population, over 40% of the total population is rural, and within of that population, at least half are subsistence farmers. 
But as Mario mentioned, you know, the bulk of national supply is actually produced by commercial producers who do have access to irrigation systems. And as we'll get to, so far those irrigation systems have only been slightly affected this year, but there is increasing concern for the implications in 2024. So the conclusion here is that for FuseNet's analysis, whether shocks in Central America are a key driver of acute food insecurity, but particularly among those subsistence farmers who are producing for their own consumption. Now in Venezuela, we have a different context. Uh, pasta, rice, maize, and local roots and tubers are the main staple foods in Venezuela. And while Venezuela used to be quite productive since uh, over the past decade during its macro macroeconomic crisis, we've seen a extreme erosion of the agricultural production sector, such that um, in over the past few years, Venezuela has now become structurally deficit in production of staple foods and relies on imports for over 60% of its supply. And while this, uh, uh, erosion of that sector led to food shortages around 2017 to 2019. We've seen a stabilization of the economy um, and uh, improvement in its capacity to meet its own food needs through imports um, and to some degree own production. Another important contextual aspect is that more than 85 of Venezuela's population is urban and less than 15% is rural. Most of the production is concentrated in the West Andes and Central Los Llanos regions where irrigation, um, both pivot and drip irrigation is playing a significant role in supporting production. So in Venezuela, weather shocks, uh, at least for the period of analysis so far, are not really a driver of food insecurity. It's mainly the economy. And then finally, in Haiti, rice is the main staple food in Haiti, followed by wheat, flour, maize, roots and tubers, and beans. But rice is by far and away uh, the most important for consumption within the country, and most of this is imported. So Haiti uh, used to be self-sufficient in staple food production, but that's progressively declined over the past few decades. And as of now, Haiti imports over 70% of its staple cereal supplies with over 90% of rice uh, imported primarily from the United States. Now in the Haitian context, over 40% of the population is rural. Um, in addition to some subsistence production, this population really relies on uh, income learned from on, earned from on-farm and off-farm labor to purchase their food needs. But in Haiti, we have a multiple um, shock, uh, multiple shocks that drive acute food insecurity, namely conflict driven by gang violence, um, as well as structural uh, economic issues, and then finally weather, which tends to exacerbate those bigger drivers of acute food insecurity. So now um, we'll take a look at the seasonal calendar for some additional context on when we are concerned about acute food insecurity. So Mario was focusing on, you know, the different periods of rainfall and what that meant for East region. And in Central America, we have two rainy seasons, the Primera and the Secunda, um, with uh, spanning from April to November, December, depending on where you are in the region. Um, and this uh, rainfall supports uh, Primera uh, crop cultivation, uh, Postrera uh, cult crop cultivation, and then in Nicaragua, the Aponte uh, cultivation season spanning from about, uh, well, planting beginning much earlier, but your harvesting becomes available starting in August. You have your next key harvest in November, and then finally that Nicaraguan harvest in January. And the other important thing to keep in mind is on uh, the peak period of cash crop labor demand. Um, so for things like coffee, fruits, uh, vegetables, and so on. And that begins in October and runs through March. And this is really driven by um, demand for labor on commercial production farms. And this plays a really key role in uh, household income among subsistence farming populations. They're not only relying on their own subsistence production, but really heavily relying on income earned from these labor opportunities to smooth their consumption and purchase their food. So what all of this means based on you know, what we've observed so far this year is that subsistence farmers are the most affected relative to um, only slightly below average commercial impacts. 
Uh, but nevertheless, you know, these harvests are becoming available now. And even though they are below average, they are providing food supplies as we are looking into the forthcoming months. But our period of, so that means our period of concern is really the lean season of next year. And even following that, depending on how badly the next few months go and what that implies for Primera production next year, particularly if we see a decline in irrigation resources available for commercial, produ commercial production. So you're not seeing a huge uptick in FUSNET's assessment of food insecurity outcomes now but we are very increasingly concerned for what might occur as we move into 2024. And when we look at the key production areas of Central America, you know, this illustrates where we are concerned uh, primarily, and that's um, these maps are showing uh, production uh, basins in for maize in the first production season on the left and the second production season, uh, production season on the right where green is typically sufficient or surplus producing, yellow you have a minor deficit, and then orange is a major deficit. The major deficit areas are really um, along the dry corridor areas um, where we have uh, subsistence farmers who are most vulnerable to weather hazards. These are also the areas that are most um, uh, susceptible to the impacts of El Nino along the Pacific Basin. Now, when we look at Venezuela, you see a very different crop production calendar. It's far more complicated and it's pretty much continuous throughout the year, um, in large part supported by a continuous rainfall season from May to October, but also more sophisticated um, irrigation systems. So between that uh, difference in seasonality and access to irrigation, as well as uh, increasing reliance on imports, um, we haven't, our, our, our concern is much more, uh, is much lower than we have for the impact of weather hazards in Central America. If there is concern for impacts, that's really limited to the lean season period, which occurs from July to November. Um, and again, that concern is, is really looking forward into next year. Um, in, in terms of where in Venezuela uh, that impact would be greatest, um, the key production areas are uh, in the west and east of the country, um, especially in the Guarico, Apure, and Portuguesa areas that are produce, cereal producing areas, as well as some of the vegetable producing areas along the border of Colombia. Um, but you can see these are also not uh, highly populated areas. Venezuela, again, very urban. Uh, a large majority of the population is concentrated um, in and around Caracas. And then finally, when we look at Haiti's seasonal calendar, um, we also see more continuous production over the course of the year. The spring harvest especially is the most important uh, peer season for production. Uh, it accounts for 60% of total annual production in Haiti. Um, if we, but then, but then again, just given the uh, other drivers, of the, the other uh, the important drivers of acute food insecurity and the importance of imports in Haiti, to the extent that we have con any concern for weather impacts on Haiti, it's really limited to this lean season period um, from March to June, um, looking into 2024 once again. Um, this here, again, uh, looking at where uh, production occurs in Haiti, these maps are showing um, the basin. The, uh, this, this is depicting the relative product, uh, contribution of production uh, by department um, for maize on the left and rice on the right um, in the current uh, 2023 to 2024 consumption year. So when we look at maize, um, the center of the country, and especially uh, Artibani, um, is the most important for uh, domestic maize production. And then for rice, it's heavily concentrated in Artibani. Um, and this region is also uh, key for um, providing those labor, uh, agricultural labor opportunities to the rest of the population, where you see a lot of migration from other departments into Artibani um, to take advantage of labor opportunities. 
Now, in given that context, um, we'll also uh, want to summarize what typical uh, impacts of Nino look like. Um, our science uh, partners at the NOAA University of Santa Barbara and the University of Maryland have done a statistical analysis of the relationship between um, El Nino, La Nina, and crop production outcomes in the region using available uh, uh, national crop production data. So during El Nino events, Latin America and the Caribbean do tend to have below normal maize, maize yields. These are this is this analysis is focused on maize in particularly in particular given its importance to the region. Um, here we're looking at uh, percent maize yield anomalies by region during El Nino in red, uh, in La Nina in blue. And so on and on average in the region, uh, that's in this graph here, you can see El Nino is associated with um, slight, uh, slightly below average crop production uh, in the region, while La Nina is typically associated with slightly above average uh, production in the region. But each of these circles represents an individual um, El Nino or La Nina event, and you do see like a pretty wide variation in outcomes. Um, this is even more extreme, uh, that variability is even more extreme when you look at it on a country level. And a lot of this variability relates back to what Mario was talking about in terms of rainfall distribution and access to irrigation um, and how complicated that is um, in terms of uh, impacts on crop production. So these maps are, sh are, are looking at um, the visualization of, of, of the consistency of that relationship between El Nino and um, anomalies in maize crop yields. The top is showing us um, that, um, the top one is showing us that the connection is strongest um, in parts of Venezuela and especially El Salvador. Um, and these areas, uh, um, and, the, and this one here is showing the consistency of that connection over time. Um, the main takeaway here is that uh, while there are associations that are um, provided here, especially in, in Venezuela and El Salvador, um, there are some data quality concerns um, that we would just keep in mind as a caveat for, for relying on, on these maps. Now, as we look at what we've observed and, and what we expect in this production year, um, we'll start with Central America, where subsistence farmers on average are expected to lose up to 25% of their crop yields this year. And larger shortfalls are expected in the worst uh, affected areas with the strongest rainfall deficits, especially in the dry corridor, where yield losses for maize are expected to be in the range of 25 to 50%, and beans will be more significantly affected. They're more moisture sensitive at over 75% yield losses. But on the other hand, commercial production of maize is expected to be similar to last year and only slightly below the five-year average thanks to the irrigation capacity that has um, uh, been observed so far this year. So the USDA, for instance, estimates just a 2% shortfall in production this year in Guatemala compared to average. Uh, that's for maize. Commercial production of beans will be more affected. Um, currently, expectations are for lower production compared to last year, and certainly the five-year average. Now, Mario mentioned um, the importance of Nicaragua's Aponte season, and this is especially important for uh, bean production because Nicaragua is the region's main exporter of red beans. Unfortunately, it's been very difficult to obtain and verify information because um, there are concerns that official reporting coming out from the government um, are not really uh, representative of the situation and there's concern cropping conditions are worse than reported. FUSENET is working on implementing some follow-up field assessments uh, to, to investigate that further. And then finally, we have um, commercial cash crop, crop production. So those, those crops that are really important for labor income for households, that is expected to be near, near, near normal or slightly below average um, and generating uh, typical labor demand overall and typical levels of income with any slight uh, declines in that offset by rising wages over the past year. So this will be also really critical to mitigating deterioration in acute food insecurity over the next uh, four to five months. Turning to Venezuela, 
despite these widespread rainfall deficits that have been observed, pivot and drip irrigation systems have uh, been mitigating crop losses um, for rice, fruit, vegetables, sugarcane, and coffee, as reported by the Confederation of Agricultural Producer Associations and other sources. But to the extent negative impacts are expected, um, this is likely among maize and rice yields, especially among subsistence farmers in Guarico and Apure and Los Llanos region. Uh, by some reports that we've seen from USDA, that could be up to a 10% decline in rice production compared to average. But again, imported staple food commodities, especially uh, wheat flour products, are most important for national food availability in Venezuela at this time. And then finally, looking at Haiti, the spring harvest uh, concluded in September with really mixed performance on net. USD estimates a total maize and rice production loss of just 5%, but larger sorghum production losses of up to 22%. And this is because of the uneven uh, outcomes that we saw in Haiti, again, closely related to the differences in rainfall distribution over time. Subsistence production, as reported by households in a, in a survey, um, was uh, indicated that it was most affected in the South, Grand Anse, Nipe, and Center departments, whereas production was favorable in Artibani in the North, the Northwest, and West departments. And Artibani, again, comprises the greatest share of maize and rice production and is the largest source of on-farm labor demand. But looking forward, we are expecting some negative impacts on uh, the fall production, regardless of rainfall performance um, in those areas where production was negatively affected because farmers really rely on those harvests to preserve and keep seeds that they then use for the next harvest or income from that harvest to purchase seeds. And so that's expected to have a negative impact on the subsequent season. But again, important to keep in mind that imported rice is the most important factor in uh, household access to food. So as you look at FuseNet's uh, maps through our current reporting period through January, you are we are still projecting widespread uh, stressed outcomes across much of Central America and Venezuela, um, with Central America you know, benefiting from those harvest stocks that will last a few months, as well as the income earned from cash crop labor demand. But as we look forward into 2024, there will be a concern for rising uh, level of food assistance needs and FuseNet will be re releasing our updated maps with new projections through May um, by the end of October, early November. Um, our areas of highest concern in Central America are really concentrated along the dry corridor, um, as well as parts of northern Honduras, the Altiplano in Guatemala and the Alta Verapaz region of Guatemala. Um, we have a few areas in El Salvador and Nicaragua listed here. When we look at Venezuela, it is the production areas mentioned in Los Llanos region. And then in Haiti, um, outcomes in Haiti are much more widespread uh, uh, crisis outcomes. But that is, as previously mentioned, not only due to weather, but due to insecurity and economic shocks. But in terms of El Nino related impacts, um, Grenance, Nip, the South and Center departments are of highest concern. And with that, we will open it up for questions. Thank you, Mario and Mark, for that amazing presentation, um, jam-packed full of really important information. Um, I will end the recording, and then I believe we have time for a few questions.